God, and not only that, but uh, help you, amen, to be aware of what you need, amen, with the help of the Lord, amen. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, we give you the honor and the glory, God, right now. We ask you, Lord, to open up our understanding, give us understanding and wisdom, knowledge, God, that your name may be uplifted, that you may be praised. God, help us, Lord, direct us for our lives in the future. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's give God a round of applause. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. We have been going over uh, relationships and dating. Amen. And uh, we went over it last week, and we're going to be going over it this week with the help of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We have Sister Dahlia with us right now. Praise the Lord. So welcome back to our uh, dating and relationship series, and um, we're talking to the singles, and we're also talking to the married. Um, with the help of the Lord, um, I hope to cover a few things um, specific to women today. But just to get started on, um, okay, last time we talked about the most important relationship, God's order, God being first, then it's our marriage, and then our children, and so forth. So now today we're going to talk about the fact that we are all sexual beings. Everybody is a sexual being. So if you believe that, say amen. amen. Okay, good. Um, so Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female crea created he them. So we are either created as a, in the female sex or the male sex. And therefore, we are all sexual beings. This is very important to understand when we talk about relationships. So um, what is God's design for, for us as individuals and as us being sexual beings? God's design is, according to 1 Peter 1.16, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So we're sexual beings, but we have to be holy because God is holy. And today, in uh, today's society and the way things are, things become very confusing. Um, sometimes we don't understand our identity and who we are. And because of that, we don't know how to interact with each other, whether it be um, same sex or even opposite sex. We don't understand, and that's why, partly why we're teaching on this. Now, because we're all sexual beings, and we know that God is holy and we need to be holy, um, we also have to acknowledge that we're all in a battle. Every one of us is battling with our flesh. This is no surprise, I don't think, to anybody. So um, we, must, we need to first accept how God made us and know um, that he has an order and unless we follow that order, we're going to become unbalanced. So in our relationships, we could either be balanced or unbalanced based on following God's order. And what I mean by this is the Word of God says um, in 1 Corinthians 6:18, flee from fornication. Fornication is sex before marriage. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication, which is sex before marriage, sinneth against his own body. And in, t in this, every, I think many people know this, but a lot of people in school actually don't know this. We don't know why we come to our own thoughts and understandings, so it's important for us to look to the Word of God. And last time we talked about our most important relationship, which is the one with God. So if, if we are applying God as being our first love, our everything, our number one, we're going to look to his word for the answers. So here again, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, flee from fornication, which is sex before marriage. This is the battle that every sexual being is in. So we're not alone. Um, in Galatians 5:19, it says that the works of flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication before marriage. So those two, adultery, meaning having um, sexual relations with someone else you're not married to, even and you are married. So a married couple, one of them 
has um, a sexual relationship with somebody else who they're not married to. That's adultery. So those two, adultery and fornication, are a work of the flesh. And going down to verse 21, um, all 19 through 21 in Galatians 5 talks about all the works of the flesh. So verse 21 continues with envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, which I told you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So this is important to us. If we participate in, these, uh, in the work of the flesh, we're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So in Romans 8.1, the good news is, in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So the hope is that we're going to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. And if we do so, we're not in condemnation. And I know that um, people come from all different walks of life, have all different kinds of experiences for whatever reasons. But we always can look to the Word of God to help us to do things according to the, work, uh, to the Word of the Lord. So no matter what we might have done yesterday, we have today and we have the future. And that's what I'm trying to speak to. Um, okay, so now, in all of this, we described... Um, we're all sexual beings, we're all in a battle, and we know what God wants from us or doesn't want from us. So as a woman, particularly, I have put a note here, understanding women. And I know that I have heard before that it's almost impossible to understand a woman. However, with the help of the Lord, I will give you a little bit of understanding. And um, first of all, we, we have heard that women are they relate on an emotional basis. That doesn't mean all women are emotional wrecks, but we do um, operate on an emotional basis. And what does that mean? That means that women are moved by their thoughts and by their heart. And so if you're a woman, a girl, a female, most of you will understand this. You know how you get sympathetic, you cry with your friend, you cry openly in a movie, men usually hide, but that's okay. <laughs> but women, they are moved by their, by their thoughts and their heart. And in 1 Peter 5, 7, the word of the Lord says, women is the weaker vessel. So this is a scripture that gives us an idea about, about why women are emotional. It's in the word of God, but also this can be looked at literally and figuratively. So, literally, most women are weaker physically, but also emotionally. Now, um, why, why does this help us understand women? Because women, in their relationships, their number one thing is how they feel. It's their thought. It's their heart. It's not the physical. That's not the number one for women. The number one for women is emotional. So therefore, for husbands to understand your wives, they want, to, they want you to connect with them. They want to connect with you on an emotional basis. They want to be able to share their feelings, and they want you to respond to that. Now, I know that might sound kind of boring, but it's not, because women are very interesting. But, but, the, but truly, Women want their husbands to relate to them emotionally. They want them to take the time. And I understand. I'm not judging anybody. I understand it's hard sometimes. But we as women can use wisdom and find the right time. That's the goal, ladies, out there. So find the right time to connect with your husband. Now, um, to, uh, to put this into perspective on the single relationship and even the married relationship, because women are delicate in this area and have these needs, um, they can more easily fall into an emotional affair. Now, that's important for us to understand that, to understand ourselves. 
and why we have to be guarded. We can't just cry and laugh and connect with everyone, with everybody of the opposite sex. We have to use wisdom, and this is what I hope to kind of explain. So know that women can more easily fall into an emotional affair, which is pour, by pouring out emotions and connecting. And then that could lead to being stirred up romantically. Now, if the husband doesn't feed the emotional need of their wife by paying attention, hearing her, um, Yes, hearing her and spending time with her, this is a problem. A big, it could be a big problem. Because she's going to look for that interaction somewhere because she needs it. Hopefully, you know, it's a, a girlfriend that she can laugh with and cry with, etc. However, honestly, if a, someone of the opposite sex pays attention to her, he might find a way to connect with her. And if she's not wise and she doesn't, she's not prayerful and she's not seeking the Lord and her number one relationship is not with God and her number two relationship is not with her spouse, she is at risk. So this is important for us to honestly understand about ourselves as women and um, husband. It's also wise for you to understand this also in case it's a challenge for you. Um, wives need this. Amen? Amen? Okay. Praise the Lord. So, in some cases, and this is not the average situation, but in some cases, women have addictions to bad relationships. Some women, and I'm not judging anybody, but some women... <laughs> actually have addictions to bad relationships. They're always picking the wrong one, or they're, they end up with the wrong one. And I don't mean, well, there could be many reasons, but one thing is it's probably due to childhood, some things that occurred during their childhood. I hope they're not taking me away here. Okay, no, okay, no, no, okay. Um, or it could be because they had a bad relationship in the past. There could have been, they could have gotten hurt and learned, be, started to feel like a low self-esteem because of an abusive relationship. So now that leads to these addictions, looking for someone to care for them. And they can, a woman with an addiction, in which I'm not going to get deep into, but just briefly mention, become very needy, um, extremely needy on an emotional level. And for that reason, they're like, they have these signs out there and men who, you know, aren't godly and aren't putting God first are attracted to that. And they could attract those kind of troubled men. So if that is you in any way, the good news is the Lord is on our side. Yeah. Praise God. <clears throat> we can be aware and we can overcome. So thank you, Jesus. So, um, so. Now, this is another interesting thing about a woman and a woman being, um, having, an, interacting on an emotional level. We have to understand attraction. Everybody say attraction. attraction. Okay, so if you say, oh, I'm so attracted to him, I'm so attracted to her, that doesn't necessarily mean attraction is sexual. It is not always sexual. So we can be attracted to people, like people that we click with. Maybe um, you like people from New York because you like their accent, and you like shopping, and you like the idea of a busy area. So people like that who talk, you know, with the accent from New York, who like to shop or whatever, you could be naturally attracted to them. But that doesn't mean that you want to have a romantic relationship with them. And they could be somebody who is the same sex or the opposite sex. So attraction doesn't mean bad, and it doesn't mean sexual interest either. How, and this is usually something that's needed, though, in a, a relationship. Just to have a friendship, you want to, you're usually attracted to that person, the things about them, not even necessarily the way they look, but it could be the way they look also. Um, and if... Okay, 
So, it's okay if you are attracted, if you're a woman attracted to the opposite sex, uh, somebody of the opposite sex, because maybe they are from New York in my description, and they have a New York accent, right? <clears throat> and they like to shop um, or whatever. <clears throat> so you like talking to that person. They're fun. It's good. And there's nothing wrong. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. You're in sin just because you're a girl and he's a guy. However, if you're married, you need to, you should have like an extra guard up. And if he's married, you should also have an extra guard up. Amen? Because we already read all the scriptures and we already know what's not okay, right? What's the work of the flesh? Okay, so we're trying to avoid that. That's the goal. And we're also trying to enter into a good, healthy godly relationship most people i believe want to get married or want to keep their marriage or want to revive their marriage so to do that we need to understand these things so if you're attracted to somebody for all those reasons i said it doesn't mean you're in sin however guards have to be put up and interactions have to occur like behavior behavior the things that you say the things that you do the way you carry yourself has to be considered this is to avoid going into the next step, uh, which is having some kind of emotional bond as a woman, emotionally bonding with someone of the opposite sex. If you're attracted to somebody and else that's not your husband, not because you're in sin, but because of the very basic thing I said, um, you need to put up a guard, honestly. You need to walk with caution. You can't just let yourself your guard down because the devil's a liar and you're a sexual being and this is very normal. No one's in trouble, but we have to keep up a guard. Amen? Praise the Lord. Okay. Okay, so conversation. In these, um, whether, if you're attracted to somebody for all the things we're talking about, you need to, um, in any way, watch your conversation. We're supposed to have holy conversation. Does that mean we're always talking about the Bible and dividing the word of truth and so forth? No, we're not always doing that. Sometimes we do, though. And that could even attract us to somebody, actually, in all honesty. Okay, but that's another thing. Okay, so, but basically, we are, t if... We are having conversations, normal conversations. We talk about traveling. We talk about food and all these kinds of things. That's okay. However, if you are attracted to a person, you might begin to step into another area of conversation. And he, if he's not walking right with God, he might throw out sisters. He might throw out some signals, some certain messages, whether they be physical. I'm, I'm letting everyone know. Okay whether they be physical little messages or they could be um, verbal things, ideas, thoughts, this is where we have to have our guard up. We have to ask ourselves, should I even be talking to this person, period? Okay, well, nothing's wrong. Wait, that sounded kind of weird, what he said. I don't think that sounds right. I better just, I could either get counsel, I could ask my friend, does this make sense? Someone who's godly, of course. There's so many things you can do to avoid trouble. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. There are things we could do on purpose to avoid trouble. And when in doubt, just walk away. When in doubt, walk away. Don't, you know, I have had talks, I'm sorry to know, but I've had talks with my daughter, and I, and I have told her, you don't have to make him feel okay. It's okay. If he's doing something that's questionable, Oh, all right, just leave him, uh, block him, don't talk to him, don't worry about his feelings, he's going to be okay, amen? So, I, and that is because we talked about last time, I think we talked about self-value. And if you're looking, if you're looking for someone, sisters, I'm talking to all the sisters, if you're looking for someone, or you're waiting for someone to find you, that's better, amen? Okay, praise God. And the wrong person seems to be finding you. Don't feel bad by walking away. Amen? 
Thank you, Jesus. Sorry. It's, I'm, well, actually, I'm not sorry. I don't think I'm offending anyone. I think we're okay. But also, um, if he is married, then all the more reason. There should be no question. Feel free to walk away. If he's not married and he's a non-believer, meaning he doesn't believe like you, he's not baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and that, and you want to serve the Lord, and God is your number one, then you're going to tell yourself, no. No. Amen? And you don't have to feel like, well, he's a soul and all this kind of, I have to talk to him for two hours because, you know, he might never come to church again. You know, you can refer him on to some, a brother if he's really that interested. Amen? I, I honestly know sisters that were, have been waiting. No one in here, I promise. Seriously. For a very long time for the right person and, um, because they were not prayerful. I know, they were not prayerful. They were not seeking the Lord, and they were not looking at themselves, but they were looking for that person. When they didn't find that person, because they weren't with, you know, really walking with God to perfect their own self, um, when the non-believer person paid attention to them, they fell. They were interested in, they went with them. So don't be fooled. God has someone for you, sisters. So, I'm just trying to explain what, you know, keeping the boundaries up, I hope I'm very clear. Um, watching your emotions, know that you have them. Brothers, know that we are emotional, yes, but we're not, doesn't mean we're unbalanced and we're all running around with emotional addictions or anything like that. However, um, if you're married, know that you have to pay attention to your wife and talk to her sometimes, amen? <laughs> and... So, so let's say we move into another area. We have weaknesses. Sometimes people just naturally have certain weaknesses. Um, and they struggle. You know, some people struggle. They counsel with the pastor about their struggles. It could be serious. It could be lust. It could be lying. It could be cheating. It could be lack of commitment. That's why some, you know, don't get married. Lack of commitment. Um, things like this. Whatever it is. As we're going through these, these um, lessons, look to the Word of God to, and let God, God's Word convict you. Because if it does, then you will be able to admit and confess to God and say, Lord, you know what? I saw that was me. I have a problem. I think I'm weak in this area. I think I open myself up to anybody who will talk to me because I need attention. I think that I, I go ahead and I talk to multiple people because I can't commit. I don't think that's right, Lord. And I'm opening up myself. I'm a sexual being. I have to apply the word of God and try to stay away from the wrong relationship. Honestly. So, Lord, please forgive me. Please examine my heart. This is what we need to do. We can admit and confess to the Lord our true weaknesses. And he will help us. Amen? So that's the first step, to have victory over your weakness. Admit it, confess it, don't be afraid. God still loves you. He still wants you. He's still going to be with you. Now, what else can you do after you confess, after you admit, after you talk to God? Very importantly, you can control your thought life. Everybody say, control my thought life. How do you do that? Through the Word of God. That's the basic, easiest way to get started, through the Word of God. In other words, put the Word of God in your head. How are you going to do that? Read it, hear it, talk about it. And the pastor, he teaches us, and it's very helpful. It has helped me. Memorize scriptures. Those, those places that you're battling, memorize those scriptures. If you have a hard time memorizing them, write them down and read them all the time to start replacing those thoughts, those things that stop you from going forward. Amen? 
And then after you get, you start, you start getting the control on your thought life because it doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. You begin controlling your speech. Control the things you say. Don't say things like, I'm always going to have this problem. No one's ever going to marry me. I know we some say that. Uh, I'll never find the right one. It's going to take forever. Maybe he's just not there, so maybe he's the one. Don't say things like that, sisters. Believe that God is going to answer your prayers and wait upon the Lord. Amen? And then another thing about controlling your speech or your talk is the conversations that you have with your girlfriends. Because some are very, um, some people get a little too jokey. And they say, I don't know that's a weird word, but anyway, they, you know, kid around way too much. And they say things that are very unhealthy, and it leads into these ungodly conversations. And that could even happen in your relationship with your boyfriend, girlfriend. So we have, if we're controlling our thought life, especially because we are, we do have weaknesses. Everyone has some kind of weakness. So if we're controlling our thought life, we have to control our speech also, and it'll be way easier, and we'll be much more successful, and we will not get involved in a conversation with someone of the opposite sex that takes us to the next level, which is a physical relationship that we're not supposed to have. Amen? I'm almost done. Okay. Um, another final thing, or, yeah, final thing is temperance. Self-control. We have to practice self-control. Amen? And how many here are filled with the Holy Ghost, by the way? Thank you. Okay. Some of you didn't raise your hand, but I know that you are, and you're being shy or something. So I think at least 90% of us are filled with the Holy Ghost, which means 90% of us have inside of us self-control. It's called temperance. And it's trying to exercise itself. It wants to come out of us, self-control. Meaning, once we control our thought life, which is we can do so with temperance, and we control our talk, we can, we can exercise, or we are exercising actually self-control. But we can do it in every area, in the physical. Amen? So we don't have to give in to the flesh, bottom line. We don't have any, any real excuse, actually. And I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm here to believe in God's word that today and forward we have victory. God has given us the tool to overcome. And I'm going to, um, I'm done. The last thing I want to say is, why do I care about this? Why should I care? Why do you care? <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Because God has a plan for you. And you want to receive that plan. You want it to be real in your life. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. And may God bless you, Sister Dahlia. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to go over some of these things. It might be repetitious, but uh, it's okay with the help of the Lord. Uh, I want you all to understand what, it's, uh, what, what it stems from and what it is. And uh, one of the things that I want to go over with you is Genesis 127, which he quoted in the beginning was, God created man. In his own image, in the image of, of God, created he him. Male and female, created he them. So in the beginning, the Bible says uh, we are created in God's image. So the Bible saying, first of all, uh, that we had God's image, God's stamp. And then when man fell, uh, that's when sin came in. So then we have to battle uh, on a person that's born, is born with a sinful nature. So when they're born with a sinful nature, uh, this is why you don't have to teach them to, to steal, to lie, to cheat, to connive. 
because it's already instilled inside of their, of their flesh, inside of their nature. And this is why a person needs to get reborn again uh, so that they can wash away all those things and start serving God correctly and still putting, start putting God first like if they were back in the garden all over again. So you have to understand that we have the fallen nature. And so we were created, as far as the Scripture is saying in Genesis, he told Adam and Eve, go and replenish the earth. They weren't going to replenish the earth by looking at each other. Can you say amen? They're going to go and replenish the earth by having sexual intercourse. So we were created to be, have sex, we were sexual beings. So I need you to understand that God is the one that created it, not the devil. So God is the one that created the, the, for us to, have, to be sexual beings. But in the process, man has distorted that thing, and now it has become something filthy, something dirty, something ugly. Uh, now most of the billboards are, are, are more focused towards men. Uh, you have a lot of the, the porn industry, and you have a lot of the billboards, you have a lot of the things that are fo focused towards men. And you have to understand that if the enemy can try to come in to try to distract you in this, then you won't give the full attention to your wife, you won't give the full attention to the things that are there. And this is why it's so difficult for some, because they get off track, and now they don't communicate with their wives. And the problem is, is that when you don't communicate with your wife, uh, then she starts looking for communication somewhere else. And when she starts looking for communication somewhere else, it, it's a bother for you. It, this is why the sister's number one uh, complaint is that he doesn't listen to me. Can the sister say amen? amen. All right. I know he's sitting right there, but just, just bear with me. <laughs> amen. Number one reason is he doesn't, he doesn't listen to me. So I need you to understand, brothers, that uh, in order for us to start dealing in their world and start working and start dealing and helping them, we're going to have to understand their world. Their, their world is totally different. Our world is, uh, is something from A to B. Uh, their world is from A to Z. Ours is just get to the point. Theirs is an emotional thing where you have to go all the way around and then look at it far distance and you already know where you have to go but you just got to go along for the ride everybody with me so you have to understand that when uh, your wife speaks to you you're going to have to just sit there and listen the ones that say hey you know what just don't i don't want to talk about it right now leave me alone just leave me alone i don't want to talk about it and then she tries to talk to you again. You know what? Leave me alone. You, you don't have no idea what you're doing by shutting her down. You're shutting down the thing that the Lord gave you in the garden. He said, she will become your helpmate. So you are shutting down your helpmate. The thing that's supposed to enhance you. The person that's supposed to be there to enhance your ministry, enhance you, and bless you, you shutting it down. Can you say amen? So you have to understand that if your wife is an emotional uh, creature and the Lord created her this way, then you have to start practicing patience. We got one amen on that one. Patience. There has to be patience. All the brothers say patience. That was a lifeline. Amen. They're, they're practicing patience too. Anyway, the brothers got to practice patience because they have to start talking to them and helping them to understand. Uh, and this is why it's so difficult because they don't want to understand their world. They want them to understand their world. Can you say amen? You, you need to understand where I'm coming from, but I'm not going to understand where you're coming from. And this is why it gets so difficult. That is not leadership. Leadership is understanding what people want that you're leading 
and helping them to get to the place where they need to be. So you have to understand that a leader is not one who pushes, is one who encourages. So you, I want you ever to all to understand, a man has to know to start dealing with his wife and helping her to feel secure, to feel safe. She has to release. In some cases, she releases by an emotional talk. Just by you talking to her when you get home and you and you talking to her and just talking to her about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, talking to her, she's releasing and she's just communicating and connecting with you. And it's become so powerful, the relationship that she has. But if you shut her down and then later on wanting to be with her, you're just like shutting down everything in your life and it's not going to work. You're shooting yourself in your foot. And it's not supposed to function that way. Now, since we are created, uh, since we are created uh, sexual beings, everyone has the sexual desire and has a temptation of sexual things. All the way from this person right here, there's nobody there, going all the way to the room, <laughs> covering me, going back over here. Everybody deals with temptation of sexual desire. Everybody. If you say no, then you're a liar. And you need to re re come to the altar and repent because you don't only have that problem, you got a lying problem too. Everybody with me? So I want everybody to understand, you're supposed to learn this stuff in church, not at, uh, not at other stuff. So I want everybody to understand that everybody deals with all of this. And when you get to the point in your life when you are single, when you get to the point in your life when you no longer need somebody to approve who you are or your value, then you reach where God wants you to be. Let me say that again so you understand. When you get to the point where you don't need anybody to approve or value who you are, then you have gotten to where God wants you to be. You don't need somebody to approve who you are and then for you to connect to that person and then all of a sudden now you need that person and that person becomes God in your life. And that's not the way it's supposed to happen. So you have to let God become God first. You have to learn first. Adam had a relationship with God first before he had it with Eve. So you have to understand you have to have a relationship with God first. Why? Because in your marriage, once you start courting and once you start courting one another, you, he's going to say certain things that are not going to line up with the word. I will guarantee you he'll say something that will not line up with the word. And she will say something that will not line up with the word of God. And you have your own convictions and he has his own convictions. And there's where you start putting the line. Wait a minute. Why, why is he saying this? Why is, this, why is she saying this? And why is this happening? And this is why you start putting your foot down and saying, wait a minute, this is not what the Word of God says. Your measure is the Word of God. It's not your feelings and it's not your emotions. Your measure of where someone's supposed to be spiritually is the Word of God. So you have to understand, listen, this is, what I, this is the way I see it and this is the way I believe if the pastor is getting out of the Word of God, then that's a time that you cannot be under him. Does that make sense? The moment he starts getting out of the Word of God and starts moving out and starts bringing up these crazy doctrines, is the moment that you say, God bless you, i got to go. My family's gone. We're, we're gone. One of the number one things that you need to understand is that that's called accountability. You need to be accountable for your family. You just don't follow anybody. You just got to go by the guide, by the Word of God. Okay, well, the same thing happens and follows through when you're dating somebody. They have to follow the Word of God, and they have to go by the Word of God. And if they're not going by the Word of God, then it's going to end up in the wrong place later on. Not only that, when you get married, amen, when you get married, all of a sudden now, 
you didn't establish it, the foundation, by the word. So if you didn't establish it by the word, then you establish it by the feelings and the emotions. And that's what you're going to live by is feelings and emotions as you're married. So when a person is married and they're going by feelings and emotions, they don't have an accountability because they just go by what they feel, by what they think is right, not by what they know is right in the word of God. So when the, when the Bible tells us that she's the weaker vessel, uh, brothers, uh, honor your wife because she's the weaker, because of the weaker vessel, then we should be doing that scripture. We should be following that scripture. And this is one of the reasons why when a husband is not doing the scripture, you know, it's almost, it, it, you got to be really careful because then you start following your husband and not following the word of God. And then you start serving your husband instead of serving God. Your convictions in the beginning are no longer there. Now their convictions are with your husband, and they're not with the Word of God that you found in the beginning. A foundation was the convictions with you and God. That's supposed to stay all the time, even though you're married. Does that make sense? Those convictions are supposed to stay with you, from the beginning, and they're not supposed to go ahead and now adjust to your husband, because if your husband starts saying stuff that he shouldn't be saying, then what convictions are going to be there to say, wait a minute, he's not saying this correctly, and the Word of God says this. You can stand. You have more power than you think you have, sister. I'm just letting you know. You have more power than you think you do. And this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult. My wife was talking about uh, an emotional thing happening to the sisters. You have to start learning to stand on the Word of God so that this way, emotionally, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't get a hold of you. And this is why it's so difficult for some because they allow this to happen and they allow this person and this person just to talk to them. And by the time you know it, they've opened up and they have allowed themselves to be somewhere where they know they shouldn't be. And you've got to understand, when the Bible is telling us that we are uh, creatures of, of, uh, of a nature, of a fallen nature, we have to overcome this nature on a daily. You need to overcome this nature on a daily basis. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you need to overcome it daily. Can you say amen, church? If you overcome it on a daily, then God's going to do something great in your life. Now, let's go to the scripture. The scripture says in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Let's go to that one. It says this, But each of you is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is con uh, conceived, it bringeth forth, it, its birth is sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives, forth, gives birth to death. So the Bible tells us this. First of all, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Amen? Okay, so temptation is not coming from without. I want everybody to understand. Temptation does not come from without of you. It doesn't come from out there. Because that's not what the scripture says. The Bible says every person is drawn away from his own lust and enticed, which comes from the inside. Everybody with me so far? So the temptation is not coming from the outside. The temptation is coming from the inside. Because you do not have a strong relationship with God, and God is not greater in your heart than your desires, then your desires start manifesting instead of God manifesting. Does that make sense? So I want everybody to understand that the desires that you have will start manifesting to the top. And when they start manifesting to the top, it's because the God of glory is not supposed to, he's supposed to be number one. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. So if you have him in the center of your life, then these things are not going to be manifesting themselves. And if they manifest themselves, they're coming out. It's for you to see them and then overcome them. Can you say amen, church? So there is a process. 
there is a process that takes place. The Bible tells us, first of all, you, when you're tempted, tempt, temptation is not a sin. When you're tempted, even Jesus Christ was tempted. Even when temptation is not a sin. But the Bible tells us there's a process. It says, but each one is tempted by his own evil desires, and he is dragged away and enticed. Then he says, then after desire is conceived. It's almost like something that's happening to you, and there's a process that happens. A person doesn't backslide overnight. You don't worship the Lord on Sunday, run around and glorify God, and then come and repent, speak in tongues, and then backslide on Monday morning. A person backslides. There's a process of a person backsliding. So I want everybody to understand there's a, there's a process that happens to this individual. It's already a thought that has happened inside of their heart. So you've got to understand that when a person is dating somebody, it's good to be for there for a little distance in time. So their fruits, you know them by their fruits. And their fruits will start coming out and start showing what you need to do. Now, I'm going to throw a disclaimer in here again because I don't want everybody to understand that uh, this is the only way. If you want to serve God correctly, we're trying to show you because whatever we have done, it worked for us. But if you want to do it any which way you want to, that's up to you. you this is not the only way uh, of, you know, of how we're serving God or what we're doing or courting somebody. If you want to do it your way, you can do it your way. That's up to you. But I want everybody to understand, if you want to serve God correctly, then we're trying to help you to be a guide, to be a blessing to you and your life up ahead. Why? This is your future. This is your life. This is your family. Can you say amen, church? So when someone starts dating somebody, the very first thing that we need to see is uh, biblical. Uh, we need to see what it is it, and how this church really functions in that way. Now, uh, there's leaderships here. There are men that we have ministries. We have ministers in this church. And then we have leaders of groups. The leaders have their best intention out for you. That's, that's what they're supposed to be doing, having their best intention out for you. For you to be blessed, for you to move forward, for you to help you spiritually, for you to keep moving forward, uh, grow and continue to keep growing. So then what happens is, is that you should be seeking counsel with the ones that are guiding are being guided by the groups, not only that, by the pastor, to see whether or not uh, it's okay for you to go ahead and continue because some people don't know whether or not they're okay in the area of where they're at. Some people think, okay, I'm baptized two months now. Man, I'm ready to fellowship. Can you say, I'm ready to date, I'm ready to start courting. And that is incorrect. That person has to have a foundation with God, and they have to have a, number, a relationship with the Lord first, and then try to bring in, you're going to try to bring in another relationship when you're trying to have a relationship with God. That's all that's going to do is just confuse the matter. So it's going to be very difficult for you. So your relationship with God comes first how you are, what you do, convictions that set in. This is the way it's supposed to be. And then when a person comes to you and wants to date you or wants to be with you and court you, then it should go through the proper channels. If you're going to be in the church and do it correctly, then it should go to your leader or to the pastor. And I would either guide you and direct you, and I will help you and show you what you need to do. There has to be some counseling before you guys get married. There has to be some kind of direction before you get married to see if both of you are on the same page. You can have an infatuation for one another, but yet not understand that she wants to live in California and he live, wants to live in Washington. She wants to have four kids. He just wants to have one. So there's a, there could be a lot of conflict. And this is why you need the, uh, the counseling to help you to overcome what you need in your life to help you to overcome and keep moving forward. And that way a union starts to happen. Remember, marriage happened before government. Marriage happened before anything. So government can come in and try to dictate to you or show you what, what marriage is. 
between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. That's not what marriage is. That, that was instituted in the garden from a man and a woman. It wasn't Adam and Steve. It was Adam and Eve. Can you say amen, church? I just want everybody to understand. So if you have a desire, uh, you ha- we all are all born with that sexual desire. All of us. Every one of you. Unless something is wrong with you. You don't have that uh, chromosome or you don't have that... Amen. So I want you to understand that every one of us was, was born with that desire. So it's, God has put it in there for a reason. And this is why when it's time for you, when it's your season, turn to your neighbor and tell when it's your season. When it is your season. Some people want to pull out the corn before it's season. Some people want to pull out the carrots before it's their season. They get carrots that are this small, and then they got all kinds of roots sticking out of them and everything else, like they're deformed. They want to pull things out before it's their season. You don't want to do that. You want to wait till God shows you that it's your time, and then God's going to bless you. God already knows your desire. God knows what you're going through. God sees what you need to do. But listen, let me explain something to you. If you're baptized and she's not baptized, you're already starting off on the wrong foot. If he's baptized and she, he's not baptized and she's not, and she's baptized, you're already starting off because you're trying to drag him back to the Garden of Eden and trying to bring him into the presence when he's supposed to find the presence of the Lord all by himself. Can you say amen, church? So you have to start self-examining. Is it time for you? Is it time for you to be with somebody right now? Are you ready for relationship? Are you ready for you to go ahead and uh, start taking upon responsibility? Because with freedom comes responsibility. Most people that are young people, they are 15, 16, 17. uh, They say, man, I can't wait to be 18 so I can get out of the house. They have no idea about rent. They have no idea about the food they need to buy. They have no idea about the light bill and the gas bill. Oh, I wish I had somebody. They have no idea about the, ga- the car they need to buy and the insurance they need for the car. They have no idea. With them, I, as soon as I get 18, I am out of here. They have no idea that with freedom comes responsibility. So you got to thank the Lord that if you're still with your mama and your daddy, you, you better thank the Lord for that. You better thank God for your parents every day. Now, I only got three more minutes. And I'm going to talk about the brother that stays in the mom and dad's house for a long period of time. Okay. The brother that stays in the mom and dad's house for a long period of time is somebody that is, uh, doesn't want to face responsibility. Uh, to them, they rather go ahead and have the responsibility for the mother. So when they start looking, and they start looking for a wife, they're not looking for a wife, they're looking for a mommy. I just want everybody to understand that. Because she's the one that takes care of this. She's the one that takes care of that. She's the one that does this and that. And it becomes difficult for him because when he starts facing responsibilities, then it's hard for him. It's very difficult for him because he's never faced them before. Mom never let him. Sisters, you better be careful when you have your children. Because you don't want to be an overbearing mama. I don't hear any amens on that one. You don't want to be an overbearing mama where, you're, where your husband can't even correct your own child. Where your husband can't even correct your own child and you become an overbearing mama. I mean, you can't be with them all the time. You can't be with them at school. You can't be with them at their work. You can't be with them with a parole officer. I 
I'm just letting you know. So I want everybody to understand, be careful, sisters, that you don't get a brother that's already, that's still staying with mom, amen, and uh, he's saying, hey, I'm helping her, and then when you show up, she's saying, I'm helping him, and that's not the way it's supposed to go. I just want you to understand, this is the way I see it. A brother that's going to take a sister, he needs to provide for her. He needs to take care of her. He needs to have a house for her. She already has a house. Well, rent that one out and get your own house. I'm just letting you know. Because I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because when this girl, this, this girl, this, this sister has already gone to college, she has everything. She already has the car. She has the house. She has everything. And then she tells you to be a man, and you're like, oh, I can give you a house. I already have a house. I can give you a car. I already have two of those. So then they're stuck on how to become a man. Everybody with me so far? Lord, have mercy. So I'm trying to explain to you. I'm trying to explain to you. Start off fresh. If she has a house, let's rent it out and let's go ahead and buy a new one. This is our house because you're going to become less of a man in that house. You're going to live in fear because she can kick you out at any time. It ain't your house. You're going to live in fear. It's too deep. I'm just letting you know because you're afraid to say something. You're afraid to, co- to correct or you're afraid to correct the children. You're afraid for everything. And this is why it gets so difficult for you. The, the brother's supposed to supply uh, all these things for her. When, she, when, he's, when he's supposed to court her or be with her, he's supposed to go ahead and take her and, and provide for her and help her, be a blessing to her. Can you say amen, church? This is why it's so easy for some people just to come on in and just move into their house, move into the apartment. They already have the apartment. Well, go get another apartment under his name. Don't do it under yours. I didn't hear one amen on that one. Everybody, I just want you to understand that when somebody gets to the point in their life of why? Because you need somebody who's going to take care of you. It's going to help you. It's going to be a blessing to you. Can you say amen, church? Someone who's going to love you for who you are and not just for what you can bring to the table. Amen? Come on, let's give God a round of applause. Amen. You do not want to do your own plans. You don't want to have your own plans. You want, God to, to, you want God to direct you in the plans that he has for you already. This is why in uh, Jeremiah 29, which he read, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So the Lord already knows. He wants to give you an expected end to bless you, to help you. Here he knows the end from the beginning. So you don't want to just go ahead and start doing it on your own. You want God to help you and direct you and guide you to where you need to be. Amen? Come on, let's give God a round of applause. God bless you. I hope this, I hope these Bible studies help somebody. Amen. To get to the.